Scripture reading is taken from the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 1 to verse 8, chapter 11, verse 15, verse 19. We shall read responsively. I shall begin. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, Amen. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged and for rewarding your servants the prophets and saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. Then Then God's God's temple temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. Thank God for his word. Our messenger this morning is Pastor Zuan. His message, Get Real About the Revelation. Thanks, Elder Sei Chiang. And good morning, everybody. It's good to see uh, all of you here, here in this sanctuary to worship God. Normally, you'll find me at the 8.30 service. Uh, We're not anywhere near as numerous as you are. And so uh, we get... If you ever want to come and visit us, I'm sure we can make space for you. <laughs> Warmly welcome you to the 8.30. A special welcome to the children who are joining us today. Uh, so I want to say hello children, hello adults, hello youth. Welcome. We've got a great day ahead. In this, next mo- in this next half an hour or so, we are going to recap what we have covered in one of the awesome books of the Bible, The Revelation. Last year, we went through half of this book the first 11 chapters. And from February to May this year, we will complete the remaining 11 chapters. We've gone through a lot of stuff, so, and some of us may be new to Zion and uh, you need some help to catch up. Uh, For for those who have been with us last year, I'm going to throw you all a pop quiz, okay? I'm going to throw you all a pop quiz. This will help us to remember and test whether you all are listening listening to the scripture reading just now. I'm going to lay before you a few multiple choice questions and please figure out the answer. Multiple choice, easy one. Your exam smart, all Singaporeans, very well trained, very good. 
Question one. Who are blessed? A. Those who read aloud the revelation. B. Those who hear the revelation. C. Those who keep or obey the revelation. And D. Those who memorize the revelation. What's the answer? Now, mm, I hear some answers here and there. Okay, if you, uh, if, you read, read, uh, if you remember what was read just now, verse 3, then A, B, and C would naturally come to your mind as the answer, and I cannot disagree with you on that. Uh, D, those who memorize the revelation, I say doubly blessed. Well done. <laughs> well done. Keep it up. Keep it up. <laughs> okay, next question. Next question. Are you ready? Sort the following in order of appearance. Can it be harder, huh? A, seven bowls. B, seven churches. C, seven seals. Seals? Ooh, ooh, seals? No, 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 seals. Different, huh? D, seven trumpets. What's the answer? <clears throat> it's not a multiple choice question, technically. This is a sort, sorting question. <laughs> B, no, 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 it must be a sequence of four letters. So I think if I got my, my Bible knowledge correct, uh, seven churches first, then seven seals, so B, C, then seven trumpets, D, and then what's this seven bowls? Seven bowls come from where one? I don't remember. Yes, it comes in the second half of the book. Very good. So that comes last, A. Okay, very good, very good. Okay, third question. Are you ready? Which of these song lyrics come from the Revelation? A, forever you will be the lamb upon the throne. Anyone agrees? Okay. B, salvation belongs to our God. You sang that before growing up? Some of you did. C, I did it my way. You know, you know, you don't know, you don't know. <laughs> D, you belong with me. Uh, how many of you know this song, You Belong With Me? Wow, we don't have Swifties here. This is a Taylor Swift song, just in case you were wondering, okay? A very famous Swift, Taylor Swift song. Come on! <laughs> and E, he's the Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the end. He is with me, he is for me, he is ever my friend. I sang that song growing up, and we read that just now. So, A, B, and E, Okay? Well, <laughs> I'm spending quite a bit of time soaking in the book of the Revelation, and I got to tell you, I've been so richly blessed. And I hope you will share in the blessing too, and my recommendation to you is to take up this homework challenge, go and read chapters 1 to 11, once through, on your own. And then they'll help you to be more ready for the second half of the book. I got one final question. One final question for you all. Are you ready? Question four. Faithful followers of Jesus will A. Live or B. Die. Be not too quick to answer this question. It's a very important question. Maybe the answer is both. Maybe I should have added a third option. Uh, maybe like option C, win. Which one of these options apply to fill in that statement? We will be confronted with this very important question time and time again in the Revelation. And today, instead of going through chapter by chapter, uh, the first 11 chapters of the book, I'm going to draw your attention to three major themes of the book that we have encountered so far and that will extend into the end of the book. And I hope that it will help us to get real, to get serious about the revelation of Jesus Christ. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, as you did with John, you showed him marvelous things. You showed him the things that must soon take place. You showed him heaven. Open our eyes to see the things you want to show us too. 
Lord, would you open our ears to hear what your Spirit has to say to your people. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As a child growing up in a church setting, one of the verses I had to memorize was this famous Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Uh, inadvertently, or maybe as a young child with, this imagine, with rich, a lively imagination, uh, I thought of the Christian life as being like a sheep, grazing grass, lapping up cool water, and I thought, ooh, so this is the life. Calm, chill, shake leg. And then when we meet in church, we, it's all kumbaya, right? Hold hands, sing song around a fire, and uh, have a barbecue. Little did I know that this shepherd sheep picture uh, probably wasn't really meant to reflect this slow, gentle, peaceful life that we should expect as a Christian here on earth. It's actually a scene set in wartime, believe it or not. The revelation helped me to get real about the fact that we are a church at war. What do I mean? Let me tell you the backstory and I'll frame it this way. So the Lord made this beautiful blue earth that you and I live on. He is the creator. The earth is his creative property. And oh yes, he also made the stars and the planets. But this beautiful earth has been usurped by an enemy. The enemy used deceit, lies, and slander to turn humanity against the rightful king of this earth. And the earth became fallen, a rebel planet, if you will, cursed. Everything went bad. And in the Revelation, we were shown signs of how things have gone wrong with the world. Conquerors have risen up, bringing war. People turning against each other, doing terrible things to one another, even killing each other. Famine, food prices shooting up, which brings great pain, especially on the poor. Pestilence, plagues, disease, death. These were the signs of the first four seals in Revelation 6. If you see this scene and you agree that this is a picture of the world today, even today, you may well ask, well, something's got to be done. God's got to do something about this. It's his earth, isn't it? And indeed, he has. The kingdom of God is reclaiming the earth. It is breaking into this world and everywhere you can begin to see the outcroppings or the signs of the kingdom of God. The clearest signs of this kingdom are where you will find communities of God's kingdom people. We call it the church. The first church was planted by Jesus in Jerusalem. And it expanded on Pentecost, round about AD 33, when the Spirit of God came upon that first church. You could call it a kingdom invasion, if you will. And very soon, more churches popped up, spreading across what was then the Roman Empire, which was all around the Mediterranean Sea. The kingdom of God was advancing, and more and more outposts were getting planted. Signs that were showing that the kingdom of God is coming and that there is a greater king who is the rightful ruler of the earth. God the king is coming. And by 95 AD, in a region of Anatolia, which is the westernmost part of Asia, we find seven churches. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Uh, if you went to Anatolia in western Turkey now, these, many of these cities would be ruins. But thousands of years ago, they were thriving cities, and these seven churches were the original recipients of the revelation. They were seven outposts of the kingdom of God, and they were struggling. Struggling because the enemy was whacking them. 
striking back. He has used his two basic strategies to destroy the church. The first strategy was to infiltrate the church and cause the church to compromise, or what Brother Ziming called the phantom menace. He enticed some of them to lose their first love for the King of Heaven. Some became lukewarm, and they switched their allegiance to worship idols, lesser things like money, sex, and power. These troops became quite dull, quite useless for spiritual combat. The second strategy was external pressure. Right? If I can't infiltrate you, I'm going to just whack you from outside. The empire strikes back. Again, some of, out, some of the outposts, the enemy used crushing pressure. People got slandered, falsely accused of all sorts of bad stuff. And people got thrown into prison, and some lost their lives for their faith, and there was worse to come. This is a get real moment for us, not least here in Singapore. In the Revelation, I find that the default state of the saints of God is suffering and dying. In the vision of the fifth seal, we find the souls of the saints who have died because of their testimony. They were crying out, How long, O Lord? How long before you avenge our deaths in this holy war? And you know what the answer is? Wait a while more until your number is complete. These were God's faithful ones who were holding fast and struggling in the holy war and they lost their lives for it and they were told to wait some more. You know what that means, right? There is more to come. Indeed, in the vision of the great multitude from every nation, standing before the throne, as we read in Revelation 7, one moment they were an army formed up for holy war, that famous 144,000, and in the next moment they are described, this great multitude, they are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation. As soldiers of Christ, they have suffered for the sake of their king. You see that suffering and crushing pressure is not a one-off or outlier event for the church. Jesus himself said that in this world, we will have tribulation. John 16, 33. Crushing pressure. How do you take this? Some of you may have been like me. We were brought up in a certain way and I may have unwittingly thought that the Christian life was about finding peace and harmony and prosperity and abundance and life will all be good. But reading the Revelation is sobering. It's a reality check. It should dispel any fantasy ideas of what the Christian life is about. But that's not all there is to it. We have mainly discussed what the enemy has been doing but what about God? The revelation shows us God moving to act. In chapter 1, Christ appeared to John as a victorious warrior. He came once already and had defeated death and Hades. And now here in the revelation, he has appeared again with a sword that has been sharpened for war. You can't see it in the picture because this sword proceeds from his mouth. His mighty word. This is the commander of the Lord's army, and he's writing messages to his troops, the churches, to shake them up and get them ready to stand firm in this present war. Because things were going to get worse. But he also gives them encouragement, because through the revelation, we see growing signs that the Lord is coming. The Lord is coming. The earth and the sky will shake at the prospect of his return. The rich and powerful people will run to the caves and mountains and call on the rocks, fall on us. Hide us from the face of the one seated on the throne because the day of his wrath has come. And who can stand? These are the ones who have rejected the Lord 
and at the news of his coming, they cower in fear. But for God's servants, for God's servants, when they see the signs of God's return, this symbolic trumpet blowing, they know it means that he is coming to save them from their enemies and end this war. It's good news. So even when the going is tough, you know, the servants of God, you can look up and lift up. Your salvation is near. So this is one big way by which the revelation helps us to thrive and stand firm in this holy war. It reveals God to us. It shows that he is coming to save and set things right. But it does another thing. The revelation shows us the right response to the moves of God. It's worship. Have you noticed this? It's been happening throughout our journey through the revelation. And if I may put it this way, when God reveals, heaven kneels. That's the posture of worship. Take a look with me at some of the worshipful moments of the revelation. We saw God standing, no, as the one seated on the throne. There were four living creatures declaring, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And then there were 24 elders representing God's people, casting their crowns before the Lord, declaring, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power because you are the creator. You are the creator. When you see God, you will worship. And then we saw Christ, the Lamb who was slain, also revealed. Do you remember that glorious scene? There was this great search for someone who would be worthy enough to take this scroll from God's hand and to open it. This scroll would reveal and unfold God's plan to redeem the world and establish His kingdom on the earth. And only one person was found worthy to take the scroll and to open it, the lamb who was slain. And we see that in this holy war, the decisive fight has already been fought and won on the cross by the lamb who was slain. And that has made him worthy. In fact, worthy on the same level as God the Father. The living creatures, the 24 elders, and every creature of the earth worship, saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the creatures say, Amen. And the elders fall down and worship. When God reveals, heaven kneels. Oh, and we're not done yet. God reveals also the whole church gathered before the throne. This great gathering of the saved from every nation, tribe, people, and language. You could say this is like the completed church. And what are they doing? They are declaring that salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels in heaven, the living creatures and the elders once again they fall down in worship saying, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Friends, if you cannot see our participation in the worship of God and of Jesus, then surely we must see it here. We are not mere spectators when we have tasted the salvation of our God. When God reveals Heaven kneels, and so will we. Even the judgment of God calls for worship. Judgment means that God will deal and settle with his enemies, with justice. It is the necessary companion to salvation. We saw this, if you remember, when the seventh trumpet was blown. This was the climax after the first six trumpet warning judgments. 
all that heavy stuff about water turning into blood and light turning into darkness and demon armies tormenting the wicked, it's building up to this point. When the tr seventh trumpet was blown, heaven declares the kingdom of our world has become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. You know what happens right after that? Worship. The 24 elders representing God's people fall on their faces and worship saying, we give thanks to you. You are the king. You will judge the nations. You will destroy the destroyers of the earth. And you will reward your servants, both small and great. We worship you. We worship you. This judgment and salvation and the coming of God's kingdom will be elaborated in the second half of the Revelation. But first, we are taught to worship. I stress this for your attention because actually it's the same lesson that John had to learn time and time again. Twice in the second half of the Revelation, we are going to see John tempted to worship the angel who was guiding him through the book. Two times he wanted to worship, fall down before this angel. And two times this angel warns John, Hey bro, don't do that. You must not do that. Worship God. Worship God. There is no one else in heaven or on earth to whom you should bow down and devote yourself to. No one else. Did John get it in the end? Yeah, I think so. I see that in the way he opened the revelation with one of the most beautiful worship statements ever. We read it just now. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And all God's people say, Amen. So many songs and scenes of worship. I think the Revelation is like the New Testament songbook for the church. If you want to sing like heaven, learn it from the Revelation. If you want to see the songs that the church will sing in a time of trials and tribulations, you will find them here. And you see why this is relevant for holy war. At the heart of the war is what sometimes we call a battle for the hearts and minds of the people. And there's the one question that each one of us will be confronted with. And the simple question is this. Is he worthy? Is he worthy or not? Who is the one who is worthy to be Lord of heaven and earth? The enemy will have us think that God isn't that nobody worships God. He's not in charge. Lah. He's not worthy. See, he let all these terrible things happen to you. Most people anyway are just worshipping their own thing, right? But not so in heaven. In heaven, you see the endless, full-throated, full-bodied, highly responsive worship of God the Father and Christ the Son. When you grasp this truth, all the deception and the lies of the evil one should be cleared away. Worship shapes our hearts and our hopes so that we may stand firm and resist the enemy. We can tell the enemy, you lie. There is a God in heaven and he's coming. When we worship, we say that we will serve no other God we will devote ourselves and give our first love to one and only one. The one who loves us and gave himself for us. It's hard for us to picture that here, lah, huh? Because we are sometimes <laughs> sometimes we are called the frozen chosen. <laughs> when we come for worship, maybe one day, I haven't seen it yet, maybe one day we will see us so filled with the revelation of worship of God that we would bow down like physically, okay, and worship. And not be bothered, not doing this to impress anybody, not doing this to, 
to, to, to make yourself look good, you're doing this only for one, the one who is worthy. And in the absence of that, we are given the very visual pictures of worship in the Revelation. I trust you will see, though, that this doesn't stop here. This worship must naturally flow into courageous living, a life that will faithfully and truthfully declare that He is worthy. The word for this is witness. The revelation shows us that God is moving to save His people, judge the world, and establish His kingdom on earth. When we see this, it should move us to worship. But it is also a message that we are to declare and bear witness to. John himself had to declare it. You remember that curious incident of the little scroll in Revelation 10. John was given God's message that was symbolized by this little scroll and he had to what? He had to eat it. Eat it. Just eat it. That man to really take in the message. Taste it. Internalize it. Digest it. Feel it in your gut. How these were sweet and bitter words. And then go on to declare it. You must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. And then the next moment, suddenly we see the vision of two witnesses. Two witnesses who are not two particular individuals who are going to do mighty signs and wonders. They are lampstands. They represent the church. What John prophesies to the church the church goes on to declare to the nations. They are a symbol of what Jesus himself promised would happen to his church. Remember how he said in Acts chapter 1 that you shall be my witnesses even to the ends of the earth. The church, the faithful witnessing church, will go on to prophesy, that is to testify to the world about Jesus and tell them about God's salvation in Jesus' name and that he is coming to judge the wicked and hold everyone accountable for our lives, and that his kingdom is coming. You see, dear brothers and sisters, this is the message that we are called to witness to. We live here on rebel earth, in the thick of a holy war. We are like a kingdom colony, representatives of heaven here on earth. We keep a Singapore passport, but we have another passport that says we are a citizen of heaven. The way we live our lives, the things that we say and do, counterculturally, reflect who we worship. The way we will reject idolatry and injustice and live out the values of the kingdom of heaven will reveal who we worship. The way we demonstrate a wholehearted devotion to Jesus reflects who we worship. The things that we faithfully and truthfully declare about Jesus, all of these bear witness to the kingdom of God. Now, when you witness for Jesus, what will the response be? What does the revelation teach us to expect? First, the response will be so-called realistic. There will be people who reject the message. They will refuse to turn to God. They may get, even get very upset that you declare this message. But B, the response will also be promising. There will be people who turn to God. God's Spirit will work in their hearts such that our witnessing for Jesus will bear fruit. Our job is not to convert. We just witness. God's Spirit does the job of turning people to Him. But we witness because He has set before us an open door. Finally, the response that we will get may be deadly. Deadly. Because we have a nasty and brutal enemy and we have had a hint of this in Revelation 11, verse 7. 
the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them, God's people, and conquer them and kill them. Who is this enemy? We will learn more about this in Revelation 12 and 13. So next Sunday, Chinese New Year Day 2, you come up. Come and find out about who this enemy is. By opposition, trials and tribulations, this is the reality that we will expect. And they will test us in many ways. Our faith in God will be tested. Do you believe that even if we were to die, we will win in the end? Do you believe that even when it looks like the enemy can attack us and conquer us and even kill us, the church will still advance and fulfill its God-given mission? God says, yes. And maybe you're wondering, uh, how do we win when we die? Is this just something that we will celebrate in heaven but not on earth? The answer for that, I think, will come in Revelation chapter 20. So stay tuned. For now, know that trials and tribulations will test our devotion and faith in the Lord. Do you follow Jesus only when times are easy or also when times are hard? In fact, the revelation may make it seem like there is only one way. That to be faithful to Christ will require us to be ready to die for his sake. We will have much time, I think we will need much time, to chew on this very serious discipleship matter. It will be the words of the bulletin must hit throughout this period. It is the words of Revelation 12 verse 11, that they have conquered the dragon by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even unto death. I will leave this at that for now. Now, as sobering as all this sounds, it will not be right of me to leave you hanging on this note. There are good things. There are very good things that we have seen in the Revelation so far and that we can look forward to in the second half of the Revelation. Season 2 will tell us how the war will end. Let me share with you three simple things as a taster. God will bring judgment on all his enemies. And that means also our enemies, the evil kingdoms of this world, wicked, unrepentant humanity, the evil systems of this world, the devil. And finally, death will be destroyed. And we will witness heaven rejoice and shout hallelujah at these judgments, you know. And so should we. Second, we will see God coming to rescue his church and bring us into his glorious and beautiful future. We will be the bride of Christ and celebrate a wonderful wedding feast. It was what, it's what every Christian wedding points to. And we will be rewarded for our faithful witness and we will reign with Christ on the earth and we will be deeply comforted by the very presence of our God who will dwell with us. And finally, I think this is where that picture of little lambs lying by green grass and drinking water, I think this is where it will happen. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Finally, finally we will see that God will make all things new. He will create a new heavens and a new earth. He's not replacing planet earth with a different planet, but it will be heaven come down to earth. He will create a new city and it will be like a new garden of Eden. And that would mean that every problem that we have seen from since the beginning of the Bible will be solved. It is the perfect conclusion to all scripture. The war will be over. And when we get to the end of the book, you and I must be filled with this deep, deep longing for Jesus to come back. 
we must ache with John this heartfelt prayer, come Lord Jesus, come back soon. I cannot wait. I end with this verse. In Revelation 21, verse 5, it says, And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Then go and declare it as his witness to the world. Let's pray. I invite the music team to come up. They are going to be leading us into a, in a very appropriate song called Witness. And the basis for this witness is because the lamb who was slain, the one who is seated on the throne, is worthy. Oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, we pray once again, open our eyes to see you more and more for who you truly are. Help us grasp more and more the wonderful plans that you have for our lives and even for this whole world. And stir it up in our hearts to worship you because you are worthy. You are worthy to be witness to, to this whole world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.